Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. These are tense days in Iran's relationship with the rest of the world, or at least those countries and organizations that are suspicious of the Islamic Republic and its nuclear aspirations. As the Trump administration is in transition mode to the incoming Biden administration, whose principal officials have already signaled their intention to refresh the joint comprehensive plan of action rejected by their predecessors, Tehran is on a maximum pressure campaign of its own to push Biden to do its bidding. What is at stake and how is it going to unfold? Joining our program from Washington, D.C. is Professor Oli Heinonen, who is the former Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency and a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Welcome. Thank you. Also joining us from Central Israel is Mr. Meir Javed Anfar, who is an Iran lecturer at IDC Herzliya. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you. And with me here in the studio is our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding on the latest developments uh, with regard to Iran's nuclear ambitions. Where are we standing and where are we heading to uh, with regard to, of course, so many developments around the world at this time? Well, there is definitely a crisis atmosphere. Uh, it may be uh, artificial, um, especially since the Iranians are doing uh, what they can to create uh, this atmosphere. But nevertheless, uh, one uh, should uh, consider it um, very seriously because it can get out of hand. And uh, what is happening, even though we are not uh, privy to what is happening in the um, uh, war councils in Tehran, but uh, judging by uh, the results, is that apparently whoever is calling the shots there at the Islamic Republic is trying to push uh, President-elect Biden, in, in four or five days he will become President Biden, into putting the um, uh, renewed negotiations with Iran at the top of his agenda. Obviously, there are other problems that the Americans uh, have to deal with. Right now, the moves against outgoing uh, President Trump, uh, impeachment or 25th Amendment or whatever, and uh, you have nominations for the Biden administration officials, and then China and NATO and all the rest. But the Iranians want to remind Biden that they have the burden of sanctions on them and that he shouldn't take all the time in the world to deal with them. And therefore, they have decided to announce that they are now enriching to 20%, uh, which is, of course, very dangerous, uh, getting them closer to uh, weapon-grade um, uranium, that their parliament has uh, um, adopted a resolution that if within the first month of the Biden administration there is no move, then the uh, UN or IAE inspectors would be booted out of the nuclear facilities. And all of that works um, against uh, the background of what earlier was seen as uh, some concern, even in Washington, that uh, President Trump might do um, a last resort something. Uh, we'll have some move vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So um, if one looks ahead uh, towards late January and early February, we should see some feelers between the Biden administration and the uh, regime in Tehran in order to defuse the situation and uh, stall by some time. Professor Heinonen, I'd like to refer the next question to you. The general director of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Mariano Grossi, just recently came out and stated uh, quite alarming uh, to a certain degree that uh, it's not a matter of months, rather a matter of weeks uh, before Tehran uh, could reach its uh, breakout point for a nuclear weapon, uh, something that, of course, uh, may uh, change the equation of which the international community will have to respond either by uh, reintroducing uh, uh, an amended version to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or to uh, advance uh, more specifically in, in other methods. Uh, may they be uh, uh, applying additional pressure or, of course, uh, alternative means of strong power. How, how do you see the current situation in which uh, the uh, inspection mechanism, which is still in place, may then also be 
taken out of the equation and we won't really know what is happening behind closed doors, either in the underground facilities in Fordo or elsewhere in Tehran. Yes, uh, Mr. Grossi has certainly reasons for the concern and we have to listen to him because he is the competent authority on these issues and knows exactly which, to which direction Iran is walking just now. But Iran actually has in the last two, three days put a timeline for us. The first real milestone is 21st of February, when the Atomic Energy Organization should have the IR2 centrifuges installed in Natanz. They put their uh, three cascades already now running for testing purposes, but they are supposed to expand it. Then they are supposed to move the IR6 centrifuges from from uh, Natanz to Fordo and put it to this empty hall over there that they have fixed that this timeline is uh, 21st of uh, uh, February unless EU fully implements its sanctions and the other part fully implements its obligations under the agreement and if that doesn't take place then comes the first hit to the IAEA inspection regime because Iran will stop the implementation of these additional measures for the monitoring which the JCPO is set up. But it doesn't mean that the IAEA inspections come to the halt entirely because then they will apply the normal safeguards agreement which provides IAEA access as it wants to forego nuclear uh, uh, enrichment plant to Natanz and every other facility, nuclear facility in Iran. But all these other monitoring activities will be closed, including also uranium mining and uh, recovery of uranium from the ore. And then the last is the end of the uh, March, the end of the current Iranian calendar year, when the rest of the obligations will be there. By then, Iran will have most likely boosted enrichment capacity and is able to produce 500 kilograms low enriched uranium monthly, which then will slowly start to, together with the installation of IR6 and IR2 M centrifuges, radically to reduce the so called breakout time. So that's why he is concerned about the events of the next two, two months or so. And this is the time when. Uh, the president uh, Biden and his, his team will really be tested. Indeed. Mr. Javed Anfar, I'd like to ask you, to what uh, degree is the Ayatollah regime serious with regard to its nuclear program at a time of uh, international scrutiny, of course, and uh, growing frustrations with the regime over its conduct in the last uh, several months? And uh, can we somewhat presume that the Ayatollah regime is currently already negotiating by means of uh, provocative actions on the ground in order to increase leverage, if you will, to the point of uh, what Iran was at in 2015, or at least close to that, in order to try and convince uh, the international community, European powers and the United States in particular, of the urgency in order to deal with it in a, a serious manner? First and foremost, um, we have to start with the basis here. Uh, the base uh, idea in the Islamic Republic right now is that Iran was wronged by the Trump administration. Iran was living up to its part of the deal. It was the Trump administration. It was the Americans who walked out of the Iranian deal, out of the nuclear deal. So they are the ones who have to return. So Iran was wronged. Now it's America who has to take the first step. Um, so they are setting conditions at uh, pr uh, you know, minimum. They want America to remove all sanctions before Iran is willing to do anything. Um, they are, at, but but they are also adding new conditions. Mustafa Yaqubalati, the former uh, foreign minister of Iran and Ayatollah Khamenei's foreign policy advisor, a role which is more influential in foreign policy than actually than the foreign minister said today that he also wants the, in a new, the, the, the Biden administration to remove the trigger mechanism which, which exists in the JCPOA. So um, on the one hand, Iran feels wrong. So they are coming in and they want to be, you know, they want America to live up to its responsibilities. On the other hand, 
they also want to increase their leverage uh, in terms of negotiations. Uh, nobody wants to go to negotiations with a weaker hand. Um, and they want to see how far they can they can push Mr. Biden. Now, what Mr. Biden will do, I don't know. I'm not a specialist in U.S. Uh, uh, politics. Uh, but, you know, the Iranians were, could also be really overplaying their hand. You know, Ayatollah Khamenei, in order to show a strong hand, he says, we don't, you know, we can live with the sanctions. If America does remove the sanctions, we're not going to collapse. But, you know, the, the situation in Iran, to be honest with you, is really bad, not just because of sanctions, but also because of COVID. And also because of the rising frustration with the regime, especially uh, the, re with the recent comments by Ayatollah Khamenei, who said that Iran will not allow its citizens uh, to be vaccinated with British and American um, vaccines, anti-COVID vaccines. And this has created a lot of fresh frustration in Iran. I mean, uh, I think the best indicator of how frustrated some people are in Iran are comments by the daughter of uh, Ayatollah Rafsanjani Faizeh, who was a former MP, she said recently that uh, as an Iran, for Iran, I would have preferred Trump as president because Trump is the only chance, his pressure is the only chance that we have to bring any real change within, within the Islamic Republic. Those two comments you referred to are obviously made by the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei a week ago uh, on Friday, uh, during which he, he did say that he doesn't really care about, there is no urgency in Tehran, as you mentioned, uh, with regard sure. to uh, re-entering or the United States re-entering the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, but rather uh, there is an, a standing demand from both the United States and its Western powers to lift sanctions, which have crippled uh, Iran to its knees. Uh, but at the same time, when we're talking about UN Security Council Resolution 2231, which is uh, the only legal document that basically uh, uh, endorsed uh, the, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, we see that time and again, this specific document was breached by Iran, even though its narrative claims that uh, the Americans are the first ones to pull out of the deal, so they are, should be to blame. But uh, at the same time, we hear the Aerospace Division uh, chief of the Inter uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, uh, Haji Zadeh, coming out and saying, uh, you know, all the missiles in Gaza, in in Syria, in uh, in Lebanon, they they're all uh, being put there by the Islamic Revolutionary Guards. Iran was the one who supported uh, those endeavors and developed the sophisticated missiles. All of this in breach of that same resolution that uh, uh, basically made the JCPOA possible. So how does this actually come into play when on the one hand it demands international compliance to the nuclear agreement, but on the other hand it does what it wants in every other field? So you're talking about uh, the uh, spirit of the uh, agreement because there is a difference between the resolution um, in which the UN backed the uh, JCPOA and uh, what the JCPOA referred to, which was the nuclear file. And uh, if uh, the uh, other parties insisted on going um, um, even further and not uh, uh, focusing only on the nuclear file, going to the malign activities, the ballistic missiles, the proxies and all of that, there would have been no agreement, at least this is how the Iranians presented it, and this was an argument bought by the other parties. But regardless of, of how we got here and who is more to blame, there is great concern in Israel. We don't have too much time to go into it. If anyone uh, is interested in it, a week ago there was a piece devoted to this topic on our website on TV7 News. The Israeli defense establishment um, is greatly and gravely concerned about the nuclear ambitions of other regional powers who may believe that the Iranians could really break out within three to six months. Mostly Saudi Arabia under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, but also others, even the UAE, perhaps not right now, but down the road, they have um, nuclear uh, infrastructure. They will have F-35s, which are dual capability. The Americans are going uh, to try and downgrade them, but the uh, Emiratis, if they made an effort, could retrofit them, could 
reverse engineer it. And therefore, the Israelis uh, have a lot of concern regarding the nuclear arms race in the region if the Iranian ambitions are not curbed. Indeed. And uh, Professor Heinonen, to what degree can the international community rely on, on Iranian observance of, of international law when it comes to uh, even the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which it keeps uh, uh, referring to uh, uh, on, on multiple occasions. Do you think that at this stage, Iran can be relied upon when we're talking about uh, unveiling its capacity on the nuclear front, or will it uh, continue to make efforts, as was the case when you held the Iran file in 2003, when it was pursuing nuclear weapons, yet uh, these uh, informations were, of course, unveiled only years after? Well, the track record is, frankly speaking, not very good when it comes to the fulfillment of the obligations by Iran. We have the 2003 events, we have 2005, we have the work plan from 2007-2008, when Iran all along has denied any access, existence of nuclear weapons related activities. Then we have a JCPOA uh, 2015 and December IAEA resolution, which closed the file according to the some states, according to some states not. And Iran, now we see from the file and its statements, that uh, they misled the international community and left a lot of questions unanswered. So therefore, in my view, the next agreement, which this JCPO needs to be modified somehow, needs to have a very different uh, setup. It should be uh, set on performance, no automatic expiring of limitations. Iran's nuclear program should directly serve its uh, purpose, which is peaceful, which means uranium enrichment will only take place when there is a need, and that need will should be reviewed by this JCPOA Joint Commission, let's say, every five years to see whether Iran needs really enrichment. And at the same time, Iran needs to be provided binding assurances that they have nuclear fuel for their reactors. This sort of thinking should go to every element of that agreement including also then addressing the missile-related activities where Mr. Haji Sadeh was a key person. We see it from this uh, Iran files. So the, I think that the entirely new thinking is needed from the international community and particularly from the United States of America, how to proceed to make sure that we will have a peaceful Middle East. I'd like to uh, follow up on this. To what degree uh, you speak about the the social uh, the civilian purposes of, of uh, nuclear materials, which are very important, of course, and uh, I believe and correct me if I'm wrong uh, that it's five percent uh, usually needed in order to uh, develop nuclear uh, energy. Why would Iran step beyond that if not to develop nuclear weapons? Well, actually, these research reactors, very often, they have a higher enrichment, up to 20%, as is the case with the Tehran research reactor. Actually, originally, it had even 90% enrichment, but then it was modified in end, end of 80s when IAEA assisted Iran to have fuel from Argentina for the reactor when they were running out of fuel. So this is a very common uh, application. Uh, and it's all over the world. But anything above that is a very rare case. Some icebreakers have it, but Iran doesn't need icebreakers, I assume. Then submarines, nuclear submarines, and uh, some uh, military uh, vessels, they have nuclear propulsion, and very often that is a bit higher, higher enrichment. But again, even with that, Brazil is a good example Brazilians and the French have designed a submarine which is having a lower uranium enrichment than 20%. So there is no real need for higher enrichment in Iran. If for whatever reason they need higher enriched uranium, they can buy it. World has, as a result of the Cold War, some 500 tons of highly enriched uranium sitting unused in the United States of America and in Russia. 
let's do away with that first before we start to enrich a father 20%. Indeed. Mr. Javid Anfal, I'd like to ask you, uh, to what degree uh, is Iran willing? Uh, obviously, when uh, the 2015 agreement was uh, uh, or uh, came into effect, there were certain materials that were then uh, needed to be transferred. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Russia was one of the countries that uh, took the stockpiles and, and disposed of them uh, from Iranian soil. Now that Iran has uh, once again uh, developed stockpiles of uh, enriched uranium, uh, do you see the Iranians giving that up once again uh, within the confinements of the JCPOA if an agreement would be once again reintroduced, considering the fact that reality has uh, now changed on the ground and is not in the same position where Iran was when uh, the JCPOA came into effect. Well, Ayatollah Khamenei and, and the people appointed by him, who are the most important people to listen to on this, because it's the, you know, the government doesn't run the nuclear program, doesn't make decisions, it's an elected regime, such as the IRGC and Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, and his uh, advisors, they haven't said anything about the stockpile of uh, rich uranium because, yes, as you quite rightly said before, Iran was it was being sold. The Iranian uh, low enriched uranium was being sold. The Americans were helping them to sell it. I think it was being sold to the Russians or uh, other countries. Dr. Heinlein, Professor Heinlein knows better than me. Um, but what I know is that I can what I can tell you about it, I think is more important is that Ayatollah Khamenei has put a red line on the issue of missiles and put a red line on the issue of Iranian presence in the region. Now, of course, before there were other red lines set by Ayatollah Khamenei, this could be a um, this could be a negotiation tactic. You know, it all depends, Jonathan. It re it all depends on what line uh, Mr. Biden will follow. It all depends if he wants to just return to the nuclear deal as is or if he wants to make changes. You know, uh, I've been enough times on your program where we discussed the, the, the resolution as the 2231 of uh, obliging Iran to regarding its nuclear, regarding its missile program. And it's, you know, I, the problem is that, you know, it, it wasn't worded properly. So Iran is not obliged to do much. But look, we don't have to talk about that anymore. We need a new JCPOA, JCPOA plus, because the Iranian regime tested two ballistic missiles with Hebrew writing on it that Israel must be wiped off the face of the earth. That in itself is enough evidence that we need a, a JCPOA plus. Of course, the Saudis could also say, I think that is the most important issue. One of the issues which I would like to um, raise, which I think is very important, and um, I would like to hear the opinion of Professor Heinonen, is that, look, another problem we found with, uh, with the JCPOA is, is the inspection regime of the JCPOA. Uh, currently, the inspection regime says if one of the countries who are on the signatures of the JCPOA asks for access to a site, a whole mechanism is triggered and it takes a maximum of 24 days to reach the suspected site. Okay. In uh, September 2018, Netanyahu revealed this site in Tehran called Tor Ghazabad. It took, not 24 days, it took until April... 2019 for the IAEA to have the first access, and then they found that there was, uh, you know, traces of traces, of radioactive traces there. Now one could say, okay, the Europeans, Israel is not a signatory to the P5 plus one, so they weren't obliged to trigger the 24-day mechanism. But the fact that number one traces were found at Tor Ghazabad, that number two, the Iranian regime is again playing games and not answering questions about that that site. Again, that's another, um, you could say, uh, important justification why we need a JCPOA plus, which addresses not only the issue of missiles, but also the inspection regime. Professor Heinonen, very shortly a response, please. Yes, I agree. And these are the concerns which Mr. Grossi also explained on this interview a couple of days ago and a week ago. Iran has taken this piecemeal approach, buying time, sanitizing sites, telling different stories as a background, and the IAEA has to go through meticulous results. The key for this is in the IAEA Board of Governors. They need to provide the support to Secretariat to make sure that the Iran provides the access, and if there is a delay, that must have consequences. Mr. Oren, I'd like to uh, ask you, uh, as we don't have very much time left, are options still 
all options on the table. Uh, of course, the under the Obama administration, President, uh, former President uh, Barack Obama said uh, repeatedly that uh, even though uh, this uh, political endeavors are being exhausted, all options are on the table. Will Biden take the same approach? Yes, uh, he will. The, um, there is continuity in American foreign policy and national security policy to the extent that uh, General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who um, was in Israel a few weeks ago, is staying on. General Austin, retired General Austin, is going to be the Secretary of Defense. And there are many other uh, former officials who uh, have already dealt with such options. But the word about intelligence in general, it would seem that the Iranians uh, think that they uh, can get a better deal if uh, they have their usual denial and deception tactic. But it's the other way around. They had better be transparent because the burden of proof is on them. And if they are suspected, perhaps even erroneously, of breaking out, they will be struck either by Israel or by uh, the United States. So for their sake, they had better be transparent to the inspectors of the IAA and even to Israeli and American intelligence. And uh, of course, the intelligence, uh, the new CIA director to, uh, that was just appointed uh, uh, earlier this week. Uh, Bill he Burns. Was, he was part of uh, all the negotiations and the back channeling with Iran. How do you see that evolve? Yes, he, he will uh, both collect uh, intelligence on Iran very professionally and at the same time will probably lead um, a back channel with uh, his Iranian counterparts. So we will see a two-track American uh, diplomacy, uh, tough, but also uh, with a view to negotiations. This is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to thank Professor Heinonen, Mr. Javed Anfar, and Mr. Oren for being part of today's program, and I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.